So this is our country's origin, that all men are created equal. It's our country. I like to think of it more like mankind, humankind, right? I wasn't originally from here. I was born in Beirut. And I came to this country. And I learned what it was like to be different. I came from Beirut, which is also known as the Paris of the Middle East. I had two brothers flanked on either side of me. One older, one younger, so they could protect their only sister, right? And my father, he actually trained as a cardiovascular surgeon right here at Northwestern. So I had an inc incredible family. Great place to grow up, friends and family. My dad comes home one day and he says, I'm going to try to get this right. He says, Balad el Hurriye. Land of the free and home of the brave. He says, we're moving to America. That's what he says. Imagine my surprise when I find out, not only are we moving to America, but we're moving to what I think is a foreign country. <laughs> and by all accounts, some people do too. I learned some amazing things in Indiana. First of all, that I was different. I was so different because I couldn't speak their language. I couldn't speak Hoosier, apparently. <laughs> I could speak French and Arabic all day. But I didn't look like them. I didn't have their ethnicity. And I didn't know how to make friends. But Indiana gave me a gift. It forced me to be resourceful. It forced me to be an accidental entrepreneur. Now, how do I know that? Because today, I still use the same tools and the same lessons that I learned in Indiana to be an entrepreneur. I learned that you got to find a product market fit, right? I had to learn how this product was going to fit in Indiana. So how did I do that? Well, I took three approaches. One, I figured I need to look at what the market demand is and figure out how I connect with that market. So I looked around at the students that I was going to school with and I said, huh, they like candy, I like candy, so I'm going to give them some candy. I connect some dots. I make some friends. Then I get this light bulb that says, OK, they clearly like the candy. How about I monetize this idea? OK, I didn't really know the word monetize then, but today it's part of my passion. So I, I said, let me sell them candy. Do you know that that experience is the most profitable and highest margin venture I have had yet to date. <laughs> because my parents funded it, right? And I got the benefits from it. I'm still trying to hit that benchmark. The third thing I did, or the second thing I did, brownies. OK, not the food thing again. But brownies, you know, the pledge. Girl Scouts, brownies, these three friends, we keep the old, one is silver, maybe the other's gold. I put myself in a group to learn and observe and connect, build relationships. And I now see the value of networking because I was able to take those connections and connect them to my monetization strategy, right? Because you got to have a broader audience to sell to. So I leveraged that. 
The third thing I did was look at my heart and say, what do I like to do? I'm an athlete. I love to play. I love to play sports. But in Indiana, not only was I an outsider, a foreigner, I was a girl. Girls don't play sports. Only the boys play sports, right? So here I am watching my brothers play all day, have the fun of their life. And so I stepped back and I watched, I observed. And I learned how to play the game. And I stepped up and I said, I want to play. And they said, you can't, you're a girl. And I said, really? They said, well, you have to pass these tests. So don't you know that I learned to run faster? I learned to throw harder. And I learned to catch better than any of those boys. They call me Stick'em, by the way. I learned how to fit. Infinitely valuable. Culturally necessary, the accidental entrepreneur. I've been many things in my life. Venture capitalist, investor, mentor, teacher, Hoosier, Bostonian, Texan. I even chaired a, a conservation group on Southeast, Southeast Asia, saving the, the Sumatran rhino. I've been a delegate at the White House. Many, many things. The thing that I'm most proud of, today I'm a STEM BA, STEM, STEAM, STREAM, makes me dream, but don't you know, my heart lives in STEM squared. And for those that don't know STEM squared, it's all about medicine. I started out my college career thinking I was gonna be a doctor, just like my dad, because that's what we do, right? I pivoted and I ended up in business. Life is funny, right? It takes a turn. So now I'm actually sitting at the table, the healthcare table, privileged to be there. And you know what I'm learning? I'm like I was back in Indiana. I'm like that foreign topic. I'm like that outlier. I don't count. I don't matter. I don't fit. And do you know why? It's not really a secret. The drugs, the devices, and the treatment plans that are being used today didn't include me, didn't include a lot of women. And because of that, we now have this veil that's lifting. And we see the impact and the implication and the economic pain that it's causing us, be it quality of life, or quality of care. Profound, astounding realization. We've got lack of diversity in clinical trials that's leaving us with a gender blind spot. A gender blind spot that is a calculation that I don't even begin to know how to account for. But I'll tell you, why that exists. This guy right here, not a pretty picture. The 75 kilogram white male defines our lives, be it the chairs you're sitting in, the doors you're walking through, the cars, the planes, trains, and automobiles. They are defining us. And I don't know how, because we've got a patient here, and no two people are alike, and no two people should be treated alike, right? One size doesn't fit all. One pill doesn't work the same way on a man as it does in a woman in some cases. And do you know my mom, you know, she was so smart. She said to me, Dima, when I was sick, she would say, you know, cut that pill in half because you don't need the whole thing. Of course, my dad absolutely went nuts because the doctor knows all, right? Right? went nuts, but being in retrospect, she really knew what she was talking about. She knew that there are 
differences, disparities in our organs between sexes, and they impact us tremendously. And we need to embrace that and acknowledge that. Here's a couple of examples. Women and men's hearts are different. Women are starting to have more heart attacks than men, but they don't get treatment because the symptoms present differently and they don't get the care they need in time. An aspirin prevents a heart attack in a, in a man, the first one, but not so much in a woman. Think about that. Knee arthritis, okay. We have issues when we age, right? Women have hormones and tissue, tissues that aren't quite as strong as men and they tend to have more injuries. But then here we go, environmentally, adding, compounding our own problems because we wear things like this. Oh my God, the vanity factor. Osteoporosis, here's the corollary to this. Men are not considered for osteoporosis because it's considered a woman's disease. Our bone density is less in a woman and we tend to have more injuries early on, but the men don't even get factored. They get dismissed many times. So in the scheme of our healthcare system, we have this new metric that we're being measured against. No more fee-based system, value-based care. What does that mean? That means that whatever you're gonna bring to the table, be it drug, device, or development treatment, it better meet some of these metrics. It better improve productivity of the technology, or it better lower costs, or level up patient outcomes. If you can hit those marks, then you should absolutely consider it. But that means you gotta get personal, right? Because to do something right, you've got to take the imprecise and make it precise, the impersonal and make it personal. Because we are as different as we are, unique, we need specialized attention. And that's what the world of precision medicine, for me, represents. My company, VizMed 3D, 3D prints body parts. Why? Because we are as different on the inside as we are on the outside. Because if I'm gonna have a complex surgery, I want my doc and surgeon to have as much information as they can about me, not my neighbor, not generically, not that 75 kilogram white male. It's imperative that we shift our thinking, lift the veil on medicine and disrupt interrupt the way we were doing things. How are we changing that game? Well, I applaud the NIH for saying, we're not gonna fund any more drugs or trials or devices without consideration for sex and gender, be it body composition, body size, ethnicity, the variables that invariably impact the quality outcomes, the quality of healthcare, and the quality of life. We've got to be part of that equation. I'm privileged enough to be at the table, the healthcare table, and I'm here to make a difference. We have groups like Stanford, the White House, the NIH, and the groups that I'm part of and that I lead, like Women in Bio, where I'm a chapter president here in Chicago, and the American Medical Women's Association, where I'm honored to serve as the tech and innovation lead. We're convening roundtables, we're having conversations, we're finding ways of action so that we can bring about change and bring that difference to bear. Because we can make a difference, we must, I must, together. How are we gonna do that? Well. We're gonna collect some data. We're gonna collect some data, we're gonna look at the deltas, and then we're gonna figure out how do we solve for X, Y, or XX, or XY? How do we make a better outcome? How do we start at the beginning and not the end afterthought? Upstream, not downstream. Revise, innovate, so we can create and attenuate to better 
practices better conceived thinking. I have to say, I'm honored and humbled to be here and to be part of this conversation because we are making a difference. Even in our own backyard, Dr. Neela Magarwal, who is the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for AMWA, has started to bridge the gaps. She's a neurologist and she knows about the mind and the failures and fall, fallout of not doing things right, not getting the right people to the table of trials and research. It's imperative that we start the conversation. It's no longer okay to be an outlier in the equation of good health care. And we have a chance to make a difference. That's why I'm inviting you to get on the playground with me, to get in the game, and change the conversation. Join me to be bold, beautiful, and brilliant in healthcare. We have now started an accelerator that is inviting ideas from women in healthcare that know where the problems lie. They know it's where that 75 kilogram male is. And we have to change that. We have to invite in a safe forum, a safe harbor, ideas, opportunities, and engagement with thought leaders, people whose hearts like me beat in 3D, who think in 3D, who think beyond the norm. So I challenge you to challenge me to do this better, faster, and today, not tomorrow. Thank you.